Good afternoon and thanks for clicking on to the Thursday edition of Vogan's European Outlook for the 25th of July. Going to have a little bit of a slight different look today. We're going to look at uh, in depth the latest with regards to La Nina and prospects going forward. Also, this uh, tweet here by Shrian Bruin a few days ago kind of caught my attention. And I suppose it's a little bit of a continuation with regards to the early thoughts on winter 2024-25. So a uh, little bit of a mix match today. Always trying to shake things up, make it uh, as fresh and interesting as possible. So before we continue with the video, do me a favour and hit that like button. And if you haven't already done so, hit that subscribe button as well. Drop a comment in the section below as well and let me know what you think of the content of today's video. So this is the June through July period in 2002. We did have a very mixed picture and a rather wet picture, especially up across the north of the UK during the month of August. I remember there was major flooding, for example, in and around the Glasgow area. I came back from a holiday in New Jersey during the month of July and uh, there was some very, very significant flooding that took place during the second half of that summer. But it, uh, it was cool and it was a dreary old summer. And uh, if you look at the synoptic chart here, you can see some similarities here with regards to a deep trough over the northwest of Europe versus a strong ridge over the east of the continent with a strong ridge over the central North Atlantic. I've made mention of that quite a bit in yesterday's video and other times as well regarding the sea surface temperature profile uh, working hand in hand to couple with the atmosphere dictating the upper air situation with regards to ridging over the central north atlantic then a consequential west northwest flow in the means during june during the month of july with uh, two uh, spells of warmth during the second half of both those months this is the synoptic chart for June through uh, the 19th of July this year, and you can see similarities. Not quite as deep of a trough, deep nonetheless, but not quite as bad uh, compared to 2002 over the northwest of Europe here. And you notice here the core of the ridge ju or trough just shifted slightly east of the position in 2002. There's that strong area of anomalous high pressure bank slap over a pool of an anomalous warmth within the North Atlantic. There's the ridge of high pressure over Eastern Europe that has been delivering a very, very hot June, July. Oh, um, uh, and it'll be interesting to see actually what August delivers because we are starting to see the ridge shifting more towards Iberia. Why am I showing you this? The reason why I'm showing you this is because obviously we've got the similarity between 2002, 2024, but I also happened to look at the... Um, the situation regarding the QBO. Now, we are going into a westerly QBO, which um, is seen here in the chart. A little bit hard to see. I appreciate that. But we are starting to see, and we, we have seen the winds within the stratosphere over the equator shift from easterly to westerly. Now, looking back at the year 2002, we've seen a firm westerly QBO. Now, also... I noticed here that if you look at the um, the solar situation, back in 2002, we were close to a solar maximum. Now, bearing in mind that cycle 23 was stronger than the current cycle of 25. But nonetheless, it's interesting that the upper earth, upper earth situation, similar 2024 versus 2002, we also had a similar solar situation in other words we were at solar maximum uh, in 2002 not necessarily saying we peaked in 2002 but we were very very close and it was a strong um solar cycle at this point in time the only key difference is that we are we weren't in the la nina back in 2002 compared to the developing la nina that we have in place at the moment but interestingly enough <laughs> One big, uh, one big difference, uh, standout difference, is the fact that the sea surface temperatures could not be any more different. This is 2024, uh, as of Tuesday the 23rd of July. There's that strong ridge uh, of high pressure being fueled by that warm waters over the North Pacific, uh, the North Atlantic, so to say, sorry. 
North Atlantic, we've got this very strong warming, and I think that is uh, one of the key contributing factors to positioning the ridge over this particular region, and consequently, we have the trough over the west of Europe here. I also thought that we would have uh, the heat and the core of the ridge over Eastern Europe, driven uh, by the dry ground and the increase in drought conditions over the east of the continent during the springtime. That appears to have had uh, fruition. But uh, nonetheless, uh, 2002 is a very, very different uh, situation compared to 2024. Much, much colder waters in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And you can see here that we had um, possibly a slightly similar East Equatorial Pacific in 2002 compared to 2024, but we have got the development of La Nina. So 2002-2003 had a mixed bag in terms of the winter season. So uh, yeah, uh, just as like I said, just a slight continuation on from the early thoughts on winter that I, I released back at the end of last week. So just trying to add in a little bit of winter chat as well. I know there's plenty of people here that aren't overly fussed about the you know summer, especially given the, the type of summer that we've had. But nonetheless, I'm trying to build into the ideas now, early thoughts on winter going forward here. So uh, certainly 2002 has a very similar synoptic uh, pattern to this year. We've got uh, a fairly strong solar situation, similar to 2002 as well going on at the moment. But there was no La Nina and there, the sea surface temperatures could not be more different. So again, a bit of a random start to today's video, given the fact that we're going to be looking specifically at La Nina as promised in yesterday's video, but I thought I would throw it out there anyway. So anyway, this is it direct from Noah here. I'm going to try and kind of skim through this reasonably quickly because it is quite a lengthy article here, but the recent evolution, current status and predictions. So this is uh, primarily La Nina. And uh, if we look at the summary here initially, so we're in a La Nina watch at the moment here. Um, this is uh, the alert uh, system status. And we are likely to go into a La Nina over the next couple of months here. We're going to see an increase in easterly trade winds over the eastern equatorial Pacific. We should start to see the cooling of Nino region 3.4 continuing. Enzo neutral conditions are present this is from a few days ago. Equatorial sea surface temperatures are above average in the western and west central Pacific, near average in the east central Pacific, and below average in the east Pacific Ocean. Enzo neutral is expected to continue for the next several months, with La Nina favoured to develop during August through October. 70% chance of that happening and persist into the northern hemisphere winter of 2024-25. Now remember, La Nina is reasonably important even in our part of the world. Yes, it has bigger impacts in the Americas, for example, Australia, where it's closer to that source region of warming and cooling of the eastern uh, equatorial Pacific. But it does have downstream impacts. It affects the Manjulian Oscillation, it affects the Indian Ocean Dipole, and therefore it affects our weather pattern as well. It's a kind of downstream, indirect response within the atmosphere over our part of the world that we see with La Nina. So skipping forward here, recent evolution of equatorial Pacific SST departures. So you can see here, this is the chart here showing the dates on the left-hand side and degrees of longitude at the bottom here. And you can see here uh, over the last, um, you know, really from August 2023, right away to July 2024, very, very warm waters within the eastern and pretty much all of the equatorial Pacific, may I add. But as we've went forward, you can see the cooling start to take place over the eastern portion of the, the, the Pacific basin here within the tropics. So they go on to say positive sea surface temperatures uh, anomalies persisted across most of the eastern and central Pacific basin from the beginning of the period until April 2024. Since mid-March, below average SSTs have emerged in the Eastern Pacific and expanded slightly westwards, but it has been slow going. So Nino region, 
uh, SST departures recent evolution. You can see here very, very warm anomalies in the Nino region 4. 3.4, it's been predominantly warm than average right up until the month of July. You can see here it's still slightly warmer than average. But we are seeing in the last week or so a drop below average, and that is likely the, the start of this process, but it has been slow. Nino Region 3 and 1.2 have seen the greatest uh, cooling below average. SST departures in the tropical Pacific during the last four weeks. You can see here that we are cooling this region of the uh, of the Pacific Global SST departures during the last four weeks. So you can see here, again, some subtle changes between the 23rd of June and the 20th of July. During the, pa the last four weeks, equatorial SSTs were above average across the Western and Central Basin around the Maritime Continent and the Indian Ocean, near to below average were evident in the East Central and Eastern Pacific and below average SSTs were present in the Central Equatorial Atlantic here. During SS, uh, weekly SST departures during the last four weeks here can be seen below. So you can see the general, not a great deal of change. You could actually see a very, very slight cooling more back in the end of June. And then there was a little bit of a weakening in that cooling during the uh, first half of July, which is quite evident to see here. Change in weekly uh, SST departures over the last four weeks here. You can actually see there's almost like a, a slight warming within the far east equatorial Pacific. So there was a little bit of a, a delay, even a very, very slight reverse where the waters in that Nino region 1.2 closest to the South American coast actually warmed slightly. Upper ocean uh, conditions in the equatorial Pacific. So this is obviously looking at <coughs> the depth down below the surface here. And uh, I'm going to kind of skip through that here. You've got the uh, thermocline slope, basin-wide equatorial Pacific water temperatures here. Uh, central and eastern Pacific upper ocean anomalies here. So you can see here that we have cooled things off. Uh, really at the beginning of the year uh, compared to last year. So there's quite a big, big difference here, generally speaking. Uh, SST is back at the peak of uh, of El Nino, uh, a degree and a half above average back at the, in December. Then we've seen quite a notable drop, actually, as we moved out of the se uh, January into February of 2024. Uh, if we look at this here, positive uh, subsurface temperature anomalies persisted through mid-January 24. Variability in the positive anomalies was associated with several oceanic Kelvin waves. So these waves that cross uh, over the Pacific Ocean start in November 2023. Positive uh, subsurface uh, temperature anomalies weakened to near zero from late January to mid-April. Negative temperature anomalies emerged and strengthened since J July 2024. Negative anomalies have persisted. Subsurface temperature departures in the East Equatorial Pacific. You can see here quite a lot of water below the surface is rather cold and waiting to come to the surface. So over the last four, uh, a couple of weeks, couple of months, sorry, negative uh, subsurface temperature anomalies have persisted in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific and extended to the surface. And you need winds uh, at 850 millibars all the way down to the surface so kind of from about 5,000 feet to the surface you need those winds to be blowing out of the east to allow that cold water below the surface to rise up to the surface here and that essentially is what drives the the, the developing of La Nina opposite effect when you've got a, a developing El Nino obviously it's more complicated than this, obviously, because we need to have a certain type of atmospheric pattern to therefore trigger the strengthening of the easterly trade winds. The Man Julian oscillation has a big play in that as well, dictating the, the area of rising versus sinking, and that also controls the global wind oscillation, the wind oscillation within the, the Pacific Ocean. A very, very, very interesting but complex relationship between ocean and atmosphere going on here so we've got the the tropical um outgoing long wave radiation and wind anomalies during the last 30 days so um 
you can start to see here between the 20th uh, uh, of June and the 19th of July, we are increasing the 200 HPA wind anomalies that increase the, the cooling within the East Equatorial Pacific and interseasonal variability here, interseasonal variability in the atmosphere, wind and pressure, which is often related to the MJO, can significantly impact surface and subsurface conditions across the Pacific. So we are seeing the changes starting to take place. The upper ocean heat anomalies here are beginning to cool in response to these um, two upwell and Kelvin waves that were observed during December of 2023 and May 2024. That tends to be, provide a burst of change within the ocean and the subsurface region. Low level 850 millibar uh, zonal winds east-west uh, wind anomalies here. You can see uh, in this uh, 850 mill millibar Hovmuller diagram here, we are slowly starting to see. I think back during the month of June, we did see westerly wind anomalies persisted across the east equatorial Pacific. That was what caused the slowdown of the development of the, El, uh, the La Nina. So when you've got a westerly wind burst here, you're actually forcing warm water from the west portion of the basin back towards the east once again. And that kind of starts to slow down or even reverse the cooling process that's taking place. So that was associated with the uh, MJO uh, contributed to eastward uh, prog uh, propagation of low level wind anomalies here. So there has been a kind of confliction between uh, an El Nino hangover from last year and the change within the atmosphere that is trying to bring on this La Nina here. So I'm kind of skipping very, very quickly going uh, through this. Some of this stuff here, I unfortunately just do not have time to to read here. So I'm going to kind of essentially uh, say now that we are going to see La Nina developing here. Enzo Neutral is expected to continue for the next several months with La Nina favoured to develop during August through October with a 70% chance and persist into the uh, boreal winter. So official NOAA CPC Enzo probability show that the period especially August through October, we have that 70% chance of La Nina conditions. And that will start to change the upper air pattern over the Pacific and consequently across other parts of the world, including here in Europe as well. And La Ninas have been known to deliver front-loaded winters, so cold spells during the first half of winter, and then tends to lead to something a little bit warmer, a very, very textbook example of this is actually 2010, December to remember. The rest of that winter, we could quite easily forget. It was a warm January and February that year. So I hope you've enjoyed today's content. I hope it's been of use to you with regards to the connection between 2002-2024 upper air pattern, the solar maximum, etc., etc. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't um, a close match or not you can let me know in the comment section below let me know if you enjoyed the enzo discussion today as well and i'll be back tomorrow with all the latest current weather that's taking place here we've got a relatively cool pattern at the moment going on and it looks as if we are going to see higher pressure and warm conditions towards the upcoming weekend here as we say goodbye to july and hello to meteorological months final month amazing to think that we're almost in august already like, share, and subscribe. See you tomorrow with more. Bye for now.